reading from Proverbs 29. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but blessed are those who heed sacred wisdom. And from Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Uh, last week, we teased the new vision statement and vision priorities, and tonight I want to take us through that a little bit more in depth, um, and I want to speak to this first text to sort of set it up and then allow the text from Matthew um, to, to bring it home. Without vision, the people perish. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, it kind of got me thinking there, there's not really such a thing as stasis. It seems that we live in a universe either of evolution or of entropy. Um, one of my favorite movies of all time is, is Tommy Boy. Uh, and at one point in, in the movie, his dad says, you're either growing or dying. There ain't no third direction. Um, it sort of seems uh, appropriate. We got to uh, a place many churches get much more quickly than most churches get. I think because of how the white-hot startup culture and innovative energy kind of drove us in the first five years. Um, there was this uh, unsustainable energy output, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, but I'll also speak for um, the staff, volunteers. Uh, there was this unspoken vision to create something. Um, to make it sustainable, to achieve some autonomy. And then very quickly, in just five years, we did. Uh, and we learned the hard way that many churches are now learning the hard way, that survival isn't a vision. <laughs> uh, it's a tragedy. Um, if we get to the point where all there is left to do is survive, what's the point? Uh, and I don't want to be hyperbolic or overly dramatic, um, because in one sense, people aren't literally dying without a vision. Um, but the community disintegrates. And then I started thinking, I guess if you count the lives that we've saved in the last six years drilling 22 wells in Cambodia, maybe people literally do die without the vision of collective. Or if you count the number of people who have come through these doors with trauma or severe depression or suicidality or self-injurious behavior, maybe at our best, we're literally saving lives. Maybe at our best, without our vision, people truly perish. The point is, even without those heroic salvations, the idea is that without vision, community disintegrates. Without a unifying principle, we lack unity. We regress to binaries, dualism, individualism, selfishness. Without priorities, people tend to make their priorities the priority. And the question becomes, what does collective do for me instead of what is my part in the gift that collective is to us when we're together? And the gift that it might be to other people, without vision, the people perish. We know this intuitively, uh, experientially, without a sense of direction, we wander. We meander. And that's not always bad. After all, we value highly the metaphor of journey. And in many, many stories, the quest or the journey is the vision. And even the wandering has vision very often embedded in it, out of Egypt towards the promised land, out of Nazareth towards Jerusalem, out of the closet under the stairs on Privet Drive towards Hogwarts. It's implicit. <laughs> and this is literally geographically true, very often, Jim pointed this out this week, without vision, like if you're out hiking and you can't literally see where you're going, you are lost. Or in the metaphor of, of this vision series, you're disoriented. It's also socially true. Uh, how many of you have ever gotten in the car to go to dinner or a movie, and an hour later, you're still in the car, and you don't know where you're going to dinner, or you don't know which movie you're going to? 
when we lack clarity of vision, we just sort of lose steam. And this is true vocationally. Um, and maybe this goes by other names, callings or careers or whatever you want to call it, but people end up in a job they hate. Because it's not, they use language like it's not who they are. It doesn't line up with how they see themselves and their life. It doesn't match their own inner vision. And so we end up hearing people say, and I've had a handful of these conversations with people lately, this job is killing me. <laughs> Without vision, people perish. And on an organizational level, this is true also, uh, and this is sort of how it works. Um, Vision passes through the filter of values, at which point we can arrive at some goals, and then we actualize those goals using strategies, and then it breaks down into tasks. You could put it this way. Vision is where we're going. Values, that's who we are. For us, that's the community statement. That's the filter through which we pass everything. Our goals are what we're doing or what we hope to be doing. Strategies, how are we doing it? And then tasks, what are the next steps? And as you can see, without vision, <laughs> uh, we end up with a lot of action steps that don't have a unifying principle. And that can work for a little while, but it can't sustain long term. Without this clarity, organizations and movements, we might say groups of people, perish or disintegrate. But, but blessed, nope, um, blessed are those who heed sacred wisdom. And we've tried to do this. We've tried to ask well. We've tried to listen well. We've tried to employ a framework called appreciative inquiry that has yielded really exciting results, what we think of as our collective sacred wisdom. And, and not flippantly, not flippantly, we've listened contemplatively. In fact, we've listened long enough, and we've listened contemplatively enough that it's gotten frustrating for some people. Like, why are we still in this? Let's just get on with it. But when we listen contemplatively, which means listening with a template, we're listening as if we're listening for the call of God. And for us, that means the call of a God that doesn't need to exist because we listen for the call of a God that insists. Listening for the call of a God that is not a being and needs no body because we bear God into being and we are God's body. Listening for the voice of a God who is still speaking because we are still daring to speak of God and we're daring to listen for that of God in one another. Blessed are those who heed this sacred wisdom which has come to us, which has called to us, and which has called us together to do something. Right? We're here to do something. Tonight we're going to get into that in a little greater detail and begin the work of heeding this wisdom. We'll get more on that in a bit. Uh, but I want to run this through. And I want to, uh, first of all, thank Caitlin. She's done a great job of uh, the design on a lot of these slides. And you'll see these show up throughout um, the Pledge Drive series and through the, the vision stuff as we release it. Um, so here we go. This is what we introduced last week, the new vision statement. We share our unique expression of Christianity by cultivating community dialogue and curating inspiring content so that people experience unconditional belonging and practice transformative love. What I want to do is pause uh, in just a second and let you all talk through the priorities. And here's, here's the priorities. Uh, liturgy, and you'll sort of see this starts at the center and moves outward. So liturgy, this is where we get together. Liturgy means the work of the people. So experiencing God together as the work of the people. This is where we share transcendent experiences. The unique thing with collective... Uh, is that you're welcome to come and share transcendent experiences with us, even if you don't believe in God. <laughs> and the crazier thing is, you can come and share transcendent experiences with us, even if you don't believe in transcendent experiences. But maybe something happens to you when you're with a group of people, and you're singing, or you're having a conversation, or you're hearing something inspiring. That's okay. That's fine. Nobody's checking tickets at the door. Just come and experience it. Uh, so it starts for us with liturgy at the center, uh, and then the, the two sort of priorities with our inner life as a congregation, deep belonging, so this is committing to plant relational roots in what's already unconditional. We talk a ton about unconditional belonging, you heard it from Kate, you probably heard it from many people, uh, so deep belonging, 
Another one we've been talking about for a few years now, youth and children, so how it is that we build a bridge for all ages to fully participate in the life and the liturgy of this community. And then as we begin to look outwards, uh, community dialogue, this came back overwhelmingly in, in the feedback, was to continue hosting conversations that bring people together for listening and sharing. Uh, and this goes all the way back to before Collective was Collective. I shared this, I think, uh, a number of weeks ago, that early on I had a conversation with uh, Mike Furlong. We were like, what's going to be our work, right? There's these other churches that are doing homeless ministry and other churches that are doing this and that, sort of like these social service kind of things. And Furlong, at like 19 years old, was the one who was like, the work of creating safe conversations for things that people are afraid to talk about, that's the work. That's who Collective is. That's what we have to keep doing. So community dialogue, uh, and then focused local activism. Um, how many of you guys have heard conjunctions like Brangelina? Right? Okay. So I tried that with this. We're not going to vote on it or anything, but for me, this will always be focal activism, because I liked focused local activism. But we're going to call it focused local activism, so we don't have to explain it every time. Uh, contributing to the common good by loving our neighborhood. There are very specific ways we're already doing this. We'll get into that a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just run through these really quick and give you a, a bit more on each one, um, and then I will tell you what your part is going to be uh, in, in helping to shape them from there. So uh, liturgy. Each one of these, what we're going to do is sort of show how it connects to the vision statement, uh, the need and the problem that it's addressing. Um, we'll show you where we got it from the feedback during the vision series, and then we've got some examples. Uh, so it comes from the vision statement, really that whole first part, sharing our unique expression of Christianity by cultivating community dialogue and curating inspiring content. That's a part of how we practice our Sunday night liturgy. Uh, the need or the problem is spirituality together, and particularly... Uh, what I have termed spiritual, not religious loneliness. Um, and so this is on the rise with some of the most recent data that as the U.S. and really the West swing towards an increasing group of people who self-identify as spiritual, not religious, they don't identify with any organized religion, what you also find are a bunch of people who are self-identifying as spiritual but don't have communities with whom to practice because they've sort of walked away from some of the negatives of organized religion, but they don't have safe places to do that with other people, which creates people who are maybe still believe in God, still are open to prayer, still would be open to transcendent or mystical experiences, but they're lonely because they don't have people to practice that with. And so that's sort of something we can meet uh, in terms of a need. Uh, from the feedback, we got so many people who on every one of the weeks of questions said, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> um, and really the best way to summarize that would be making safe spiritual community for the non-religious. Um, and that's one of the things we've done really well. So uh, examples are Sunday night at five, event-based liturgies like candlelight, Blue Christmas, Sunday Soul Brunch, uh, dialogue, meditation, silence. Um, and so the focus of our liturgy is to increase participation. And this came up a lot in the feedback also, where people said, we need more uh, stability in the people who are participating regularly in the liturgy so that there's a more generous kind of dialogue there. Because the work of the people requires people. Uh, more engaged people means that people will be more committed, there will be more well-rounded diverse dialogue, and more engaged voices and participation mean more energy in the liturgy uh, and more communal expressions of deep belonging. We'll get into that more. Uh, deep belonging. Uh, so it comes from the vision uh, portion so that people practice unconditional belonging. The need of the problem, again, loneliness. Um, and here, what we heard from the feedback was we've got a lot of people interacting, but not necessarily connecting. One of the things that we have far and away succeeded at is a self-selecting community. And what we tried to do was not push people away with clinginess. Um, and Kate mentioned, right, like in, in financial matters, we don't pass the plate. But when it comes to smaller groups, we don't very often go chase people down. Many of you probably have never heard from any one of the staff or the leaders, you know, where were you? Noticed you weren't at church on Sunday night. One of the things we do really well is we say, we know who we are. We're always going to do what we're doing, and we're always going to be who we are. If you want to be a part of that, Sunday nights, community groups, whatever, you self-select in. We don't have mail-outs. We don't make calls and go, hey, you haven't been here for three weeks. The flip side of that positivity is people interacting a lot, but not deep connections. So we have people coming a lot to drop in on community groups, to drop in on liturgy, to drop in on events. Um, and what we're trying to get is people truly knowing and being known. 
deeper connections within the community. So we need longer-term exposure and small group relationships where people actually share life and get to know each other. Um, examples, uh, community groups can do this, pastoral care, the care and support team, uh, disaster recovery stuff. When people feel like they are well-known enough that those in the community can anticipate and help meet their needs. And when this works the best is when the people on staff are not the first call. Very often we're the second or third. <laughs> because we'll hear from someone, hey, did you know so-and-so is going through this and what they really need is probably some meals? And three or four people in will go, okay, cool. Well, we can organize a meal train, but we're not the first call because there's deep belonging. Because there are relationships whereby you all know how to check on each other and care and support each other. No, please. And you don't have to ever be sorry to interrupt. Interrupt. But one of the things that really helps, has helped me in the deep belonging is these conversations that you are forcing us to have. And then I was really resentful of the, us, small groups, that. Yeah. And, and yet, some of these conversations, that's how I get to know and yeah. make connections. Yeah, absolutely. So Steve is saying, part of the way we practice, and, and we'll say this, the goal of a good liturgy is that we're modeling and practicing when we're together on Sunday nights the way we ought to be living all the time. And so absolutely, part of when we talk in the services is we're trying to uh, train ourselves to the reality that it's okay to have deep conversations with small groups of people. And so we practice it. There's a reason it's called practice. And there's a reason that it's okay to resent it for the first couple years that you have to break out into smaller groups. But eventually we acclimate to the fact that this is okay and it's a part of the way that we want to live in the way that we think the fullest life occurs. Great point. Thank you, Steve. Um, the focus for deep belonging uh, is to leverage the core value of unconditional belonging into long-term deep belonging. And this requires more intention and commitment to cultivate the kind of authentic relationships and supportive networks that we desire. We're going to attempt to do this through, and you guys can choose to change this, we're using for now journey groups. Um, these are intentional small groups that form around long-term commitments that meet regularly and retain the same people. So rather than these being drop-in community groups that are more open to include anyone at any time, these are going to be groups that over time build to connect people with one another and to do things together long term. So we really can know each other and establish deep connections. Um, many people we heard in the feedback, either themselves or knew other people who had been in groups like this for 20, 30, 40 years sometimes with the same groups of people that they establish these deep connections with. So we want to begin to cultivate that as a part of our congregational identity. We'll attempt to do this through those journey groups. Um, and strengthening congregational leaders as the guides of these groups. Um, I don't want to get into that right now. We'll come back to that later. Uh, youth and children. So the part of the vision, curate inspiring content so people practice unconditional belonging. Um, this has to extend intergenerationally. Uh, the need and the problem is getting from collective kids to high schoolers who are fully participating in the service. Um, and that should be high schoolers and middle schoolers because we've seen that over the last year and a half or two. Uh, from the feedback, what people said is relationships that connect kids to the collective community intergenerational community and progressive spiritual values, education for kids and youth. So we want to see that throughout what we're doing. Uh, examples we already got, childcare, collective kids, collective students, intergenerational services and events that put all ages in connection with each other. And we're going to focus on doing this more intentionally in our liturgy. Uh, building on collective kids and students to create this intentional bridge, making a clear path from childcare to collective kids to students so that we form middle and high schoolers excited and able to engage in congregational life, liturgy, community groups, journey groups. Again, the goal is full participation. What we're avoiding is what has happened for the last 50 or 75 years, which is churches become siloed. And we get a demographic that meets in the room, and then everyone else is broken up by age. So we've got a silo for this age, and a silo for this age, and a silo for this age, and they never interact with each other. And what we're trying to do is figure out how it is that we create a sustainable community where everyone is invited to participate. Now. We do that with age-appropriate events, activities, programs, but we also have to find a way for everyone to be engaged together. Community dialogue. Cultivate community dialogue. <laughs> Curate inspiring concepts. So you see how the priorities ended up shaping what got written as the vision. Um, the need of the problem, unity and diversity, listening and sharing. This is what many of you already said. This is one of the core strengths and values that Collective holds. 
From the feedback, we need safe conversations and facilitated open dialogues and events for those who may never come to church. Um, Examples, lunch and learn, Sunday soul brunch, candlelight, the Peter Rollins and Brian McLaren events. These things where we very often, it's when we're outside this room. We're at Cafe Da Vinci, we're at Stetson University, we're at Chess Park. We're in the community, we're hosting things that are unapologetically connected to our spiritual community, but they're things that the rest of the community actually cares about. (laughs) Maybe that's the novelty. The focus, increase engagement from the Deland and regional community in safe and relevant conversations and fearless dialogues around the things that matter most. To begin, we could say values, philosophy, theology, justice, community, the list could go on. These are things that we find significant and important as a part of who we are, but we also think that the broader community is interested in having these conversations with us. And focused local activism, participate in transformative love, the need or problem, contributing to the common good, loving our neighborhood, Uh, From the feedback, doing what we can to give back to our community and building relationships of support for long-term engagement. That was significant in the feedback because a lot of what we've seen over the last few years is that something will happen in the world and we'll jump on a fundraiser for a specific tragedy, a specific event. One of the things we want to begin to build is a long-term way of helping and changing locally. So examples are faith that's fighting against inhumanity towards and justice towards harmony. I got it, Freddie. That's Freddie. Uh, church school partnerships. We just started with, uh, with Blue Lake, prison literacy programs, neighborhood center drives, collective cares, land pride support, GSA support, most recently with the children's home, which we're going to do again in 2019. So we've done this a lot. Part of what we're going to have to do is the work of figuring out what are the few things that we want to focus on and do really well, because we can't do everything. So using our assets and existing relationships to strengthen channels of support that help address critical issues and make significant practical difference for those in need. That's that's an important filter that makes significant practical difference for those in need. The tendency is for us to do something that makes us feel good, right? We see a need and we go, how can we do something so that we feel good about helping? And instead, what we want to do is ask, how is our long-term engagement with this need, with this community, going to make a significant practical difference to truly help love our neighborhood. Um, Everybody take a deep breath. All right. So the vision series is over. (laughs) Oh, wow, we got a witness for the first time. (laughs) Praise God. Um, I'm just kidding. You've got to get involved now. Uh, So... uh, Keep that in mind, all that to say. I want to I share this again because this hit me over the last few weeks. Um, this is Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, right? So he's just done his uh, largest chunk of teaching that we have in the Gospels. Uh, we're actually going to do a series on this in 2019. But this is the very end of it. He says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. First question, where do you think his authority came from? This is rhetorical, so answer it in your head, file it away, keep that for you, that's a gift. Um, Where do you think his authority came from? Second question, what's the difference between the house built on a rock and the one who is built on the sand? This is not rhetorical, feel free to shout at me. What's the difference? Insurance. Insurance. (laughs) (laughs) Not in Florida, friend can't get that past code. What's the difference? Foundation. Strong foundation, okay. Sustainability. Sustainability, all right. Well, foundation of experience, not ideas and doctrine. Ooh, the foundation of experience, not ideas and doctrine. Oh, I was trying to go back to the text. I forgot to put that in there. Um, any other thoughts? Intentional design. Intentional design, okay. Stability. Stability, all right. Future, future oriented. Future orientation. Right. Any other thoughts? It's really good. 
this is better than I expected. I'm sorry, I didn't think highly enough of you all. <laughs> um, so these are all good. I think these are all accurate. What I'm going for is a little bit deeper. The difference between the house built on the rock and the one built on sand is four words, according to Jesus, right? Take it or leave it, agree with it or disagree with it, puts them into practice. <laughs> in his little story, in his little parable, that's the difference between what it means to build a house on a foundation of rock versus a house on foundation of sand, or six words, respectively, does not put them into practice. <laughs> And I emphasize this because with all the time and the energy and the effort that we've spent discovering the vision, discovering these priorities so that we can thrive instead of perish, I suspect that there is still immediately a misunderstanding. I think we hear this presentation of the vision, uh, our vision, right? These are your words. These are your feedback. We read this and we mistake this new vision for the rock. And with a sense of pride and satisfaction, maybe, we say, yes, let's now build a house upon the rock of our new vision. And maybe even in our arrogance, we say, let the rain come. Let the winds blow. We'll stand strong. We must take the vision for the rock. But in a healthy organization, even a healthy movement, vision is a dynamic reality. It's always undergoing micro-adjustments, and then every three to five years, we have major changes, priority upgrades. Uh, I think the vision is actually the house. <laughs> the vision is the thing we build. And so the question is, what's the rock? Are there any guesses? What's the rock? What's that foundation? What? The action. Okay. I was hoping somebody would say God or Jesus or faith so I could say no, but um, <laughs> the rock is those same four words, right? Puts them into practice. The rock, the foundation is not this vision. The vision is the house. The vision will change. It'll come and go. The foundation, whether or not it stands, really doesn't matter a whole lot what we've discovered, particularly this time running through the vision series. Whether or not it stands is actually dependent on whether or not we practice it. So when it comes to this, to our vision, how do we do this? How do we put these into practice? How do we prioritize deep belonging and youth and children, community dialogue and focus local activism? These are the questions. Uh, now that we have the vision, we will have to wrestle with them. Like I said, micro-adjustment. We'll have to start measuring whether or not we're actually doing these things that we have said we want to be doing together. How might we take something like the spirit of this vision and make it tangible, material, make it flesh? How do we embody in our flesh and our blood sort of idea, the ethereal, the spirit of this vision? How might we take the life and the vitality of this vision? And I'll tell you, uh, and, and I should have talked with Kayleen more about this before using this analogy, but the vision process was not as fun and sexy as you might think. Uh, it's almost like Collective was pregnant with this vision. It was in there, uh, but it was labor to get it. <laughs> um, it was like midwifing it to get to this point. But like with a kid, that's just the beginning, right? We get the vision, now what? Now there's a, the whole life of this vision that has to be lived. So how do we bear this into the world? Conveniently, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. <laughs> we begin talking about things like the humanity of God, the materiality of spirit, how it is that in and through us, God is born into the world. And so as a part of Advent this year, we're going to be workshopping. We're going to be designing and prototyping the ways in which we will take these priorities and you all will start to decide how do we put flesh on these things we've said we want to do and we want to be, right? Because deep belonging is a great two-word phrase and everybody can go, yeah, deep belonging. What does that mean? What should I do on Monday morning based on what you think about deep belonging? What is it that Jess does? 
how do we recruit and equip volunteers to do deep belonging? Because it's a neat phrase, and as a vision, it's a good idea. The question is, how do we put flesh on it? What are the things we actually do? And it's going to pass then through like goals, strategies, tasks. That's how we're going to put flesh on the spirit of this vision. We're going to put them into practice. <laughs> and it's the table of this practice. Not a house built on words or beliefs or objective religious ideas, but instead a house with a table that is open wide and it is set on all sides to invite a community of practice to come from any direction, to belong, to know that they will never be turned away. This is the table that's set for us tonight. It's set for us, but for us, that means it is open to all, that it is meant for all people, And that each of us, right, not because I say it, not because there's something magic about the table, but because every one of you chooses each week that when you participate, you decide that no one will ever be turned away. When you're ready tonight, feel free to come and practice. To participate not just in this, but in this. Feel free to grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup.